All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to our next edition of the Silicon Valley Autoware Meetup. Um, pleased to welcome today, Anthony Corso. Um, Anthony, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, before we jump in, uh, just I wanted to give you um, a welcome to the audience and uh, a few house rules. Um, so this, uh, first of all, this webinar will be recorded for future viewing and you'll be able to find it later uh, on, hosted on the Apex AI website. Uh, please ask questions using the Q&A button um, that's available uh, on, on the bottom of the webinar. And um, I will try to um, pause at the right moments and, and, uh, and uh, ask the questions. A little bit about uh, us here at Apex AI. We make production grade software for autonomous vehicles. We're also a founding member of the Autoware Foundation and you can find out more about us at apex.ai on our website while you're there. Please see the course uh, that we are hosting called Self-Driving Cars with Ross and Autoware. Um, there's a lot of great content there and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's growing and it's popular and you'll, you'll learn a lot from uh, from open source um, contributors uh, and a lot of uh, companies uh, that have contributed there. So today, I'm pleased to introduce, like I said, Anthony Corso um, to talk about uh, the topic of um, uh, validation, machine learning for the safety validation of autonomous vehicles. Anthony is a fifth year PhD student in the aeronautics and astronautics department of Stanford University, where he's advised by Professor Michael Poffendorfer in the Stanford Intelligence Systems Lab. Um, he studies approaches for the validation of safety critical autonomous systems with an emphasis on interoperability and scalability. His research interests also include reinforcement learning and optimization, transfer learning, fluid and plasma simulation. He has a BS in uh, physics and a master's in aeronautics and astronomics, uh, which is from Stanford a recipient of the Stanford Graduate Scholarship and the Nicholas J. Hoff Award for Outstanding Performance as a Master's Student. Welcome uh, to Anthony. And uh, before we jump in, um, I wanna uh, take a couple of moments for the audience to respond to a couple of questions. Um, please, use the, uh, please use the webinar interface to, to just answer this demographic question about your role. Um, we will take a few seconds to collect responses, and I will share that uh, to back to the audience and uh, to our presenter also, so we have an idea of, of uh, who we have. So please choose the the role, engineering, uh, software, or other, or business, or in fact other that that uh, applies best to you, and uh, we will shortly find out uh, who we have in, in our audience today. Let's just give a few more seconds for this. Very good, thank you. So looks like we have about half the audience working on, uh, on software and uh, a vast majority of the audience, I think working in engineering fields one way or the other. And very quickly, I want to have, uh, ask you one more question on this poll before we, before we jump in. And this question about, is about your familiarity with machine learning, um, in including reinforcement learning or neural networks. So please select what applies best to you. And uh, we'll leave this poll open for a few more seconds. And, and, uh, and I promise we will go right into the content right after that. Okay, thank you. And uh, just sharing out the results of the poll very quickly. Um, looks like uh, a lot of the folks here are um, know about it, but uh, probably don't actually use them. So that seems to be the, the, the audience we have today. So 
Uh, welcome again. Thank you, Anthony, for, for making the time. Uh, please go right ahead. Thank you, Sanjay. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, this evening, and I just want to thank everyone for uh, coming out and listening to this presentation. Um, so as Sanjay said, I'm going to be talking about some machine learning techniques that we can use to validate the safety of autonomous vehicles. Um, and before I actually get into autonomous vehicles, uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about our lab. Um, so we're the Stanford Intelligence Systems Lab, and uh, we study approaches to de decision making under uncertainty, um, specifically using um, machine learning and reinforcement learning techniques. And that has led our lab to, uh, despite being in the aeronautics and astronautics department, uh, move into the field of autonomous driving in a few different ways. So we look at uh, modeling the behavior of other drivers on the road, as well as vision-based perception systems. And then a big focus of our group is around the safety of autonomous vehicles. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, you can check out our website. Uh, our lab is called Sizzle, so it's sizzle at stanford.edu. And we're also a close collaborator with the Center for AI Safety, uh, which is a collaboration among a few different professors, including a, a previous presenter, uh, Professor Marco Pavone. And the Center for AI Safety just focuses on all te techniques for uh, ensuring the safety of autonomous systems. So you can check it out at that website there. So um, as you are all aware, uh, autonomous systems are becoming a, a daily part of our lives and therefore are encroaching in areas that are incredibly safety critical. So we have autonomous driving, of course, um, but also other applications like uh, aircraft collision avoidance systems and certain types of robotics that are gonna interact with humans. Um, so before these systems can actually be deployed, uh, we need to make sure that uh, they are completely safe. And we're gonna do that with extensive amounts of safety validation and testing. Um, so to talk about what I mean by safety validation, I'm first going to go through sort of my model of the design cycle of an autonomous system. Um, so when you're designing an autonomous system, you'll start by defining the requirements. So what do you want the system to do? And, and in the definition of the requirements, you can encode certain um, things that are related to safety. So you could say for an autonomous vehicle, try to make sure that it um, follows all of the local driving laws, as well as avoid certain dangerous states like collisions with other vehicles. So once you've defined those requirements, um, then you're gonna put in some sort of design effort. So this can be through machine learning uh, as is common, but also other types of engineering uh, to eventually create a prototype of your system. And once you have a prototype of the system, then uh, you are going to want to test it in some way. So this can, you can start by generating test cases, either unit testing the different components or creating some sort of automated testing framework that can stress test the system. Uh, and from the testing, you'll be able to evaluate the performance of the system. So you can ask questions like, how, is it, how likely is it that my system fails or violates one of the, the safety requirements? Or how severely does it violate those requirements? And it's at this point that if you determine that the system is, is safe enough, then you can deploy it on the road. Otherwise, you're going to need to uh, interpret those failures. So understand what, uh, what caused the failures and perhaps classify them into different failure modes and then repeat this cycle until you have kind of a high enough level of performance. So when I talk about safety validation, I'm really talking about those last three tasks, the generation of test cases, the evaluation of performance and the interpretation um, of the failure modes. So I'm gonna be zooming in uh, on just safety validation approaches. Um, so the first one that I think we'd all be familiar with is real world testing. So this would be you know, putting the vehicle on the road and having it operate in a realistic environment. This is of course, um, can be very expensive to do both in terms of time and money. Uh, and it can also be risky if we don't already have a relatively mature system. Um, on the flip side of that, we can try to test our uh, self-driving cars in simulation um, under a certain number of scenarios. And so the benefit of this is that we can take an expert who knows the ins and outs of the system and knows um, what sort of scenarios might be challenging for the vehicle and can put the vehicle through its paces that way. Um, but the problem with this is that uh, we can sort of miss failures that are sort of somewhat unexpected or emergent due to the complex interactions of the vehicle and its environment. Um, so another type of validation uh, that we can use would be formal techniques. And so formal verification techniques are ways that you can potentially prove that your system uh, has the desired behavior in all cases. And if you can't prove it, then at least you can come up with counterexamples of where it violates the safety specification. So in my opinion, that this is sort of the gold standard in safety. Uh, and if we could apply this to all of our systems, we absolutely should. Um, but the downside to this is that it's incredibly computationally expensive. 
and therefore it's really hard to scale this to the big complex systems like autonomous vehicles that we are actually wishing to validate. So I would say the flip side of formal verification uh, are black box uh, sampling based approaches. So this is where we essentially randomly test the inputs to our system to try to find situations in which it, uh, it violates our safety specifications. And we can uh, perform random sampling and then use some machine learning techniques to try to uncover patterns that uh, are challenging for the system. And the benefit of this is that it can scale to incredibly complex systems such as autonomous vehicles um, but the downside is that it's never going to give you complete confidence that the system is safe. It's only going to be able to give you some sort of statistical guarantees. Um, but nonetheless, that is uh, the technique that we're going to zoom in on here. So I'm going to provide sort of an abstract model of what black box safety validation looks like. And then I'm going to make it a little more concrete with an actual driving example in a moment. Um, but to begin with, um, just note that we're considering some sort of system uh, that we hope to stress test. So this is going to be the autonomous vehicle. And the autonomous vehicle operates in some environment uh, by taking action. So this is going to be the steering and the acceleration uh, after making some observations in the environment through a camera or other, other sensors. At the same time, uh, we may have an adversary which can perturb the environment through some disturbance X. And so these disturbances might be the behavior of other agents on the road or uh, different types of weather patterns or sensor noise, anything that might affect the system's behavior. So just a little bit of notation uh, briefly. Um, uh, we have a disturbance trajectory uh, boldface X, which is a sequence of disturbances that's supplied by the adversary. Then there's a, a state trajectory that is induced by a particular disturbance trajectory. And this is just the sequence of states that the system and the environment go through based on the disturbance. Um, then we may have a model of the disturbances. So this could come from, uh, say, a bunch of driving data. And we can figure out which types of disturbances in the environment are more likely or less likely than others. And then lastly, we'll have a safety specification psi. Um, and this is basically the behavior that we wish our system to perform. And we're looking for failures of our system. So basically, any sequence of states uh, that violate our safety specification. So we're looking for basically a sequence of disturbances that leads to a system failure. OK, so to make this a little bit more concrete, um, let me introduce just a, a really simple driving model. So let's pretend that the system under test that we wish to stress test is this uh, vehicle in blue here that's trying to make a, a left turn onto uh, this highway. Um, so you, it will be operating with some driving policy. Uh, in a lot of the work that I do, we use a really simple driving policy called the intelligent driver model with some additional logic to help it navigate um, other vehicles on the road and, and the intersection. Um, the environment is simply the driving simulator itself. Um, and the state space of our environment is going to try to describe the locations of the different vehicles on the road, how fast are they moving, as well as uh, whether or not they have sort of a turn signal on. Um, and then we may have some adversaries on the road, which are also following some, some sort of driving policy. But our adversarial algorithm may have control over some number of disturbances, such as their acceleration and steering, whether or not they're going to turn, whether or not they turn the turn signal on, as well as um, having some noise on the position and speed according to the ego vehicle. So these are just some disturbances you might imagine could lead to a failure of our system, but of course there are, are many others to consider as well. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some of the safety validation tasks um, that we might care about when trying to validate a system. And I'm going to rank them sort of from the, the least difficult uh, to the, the most challenging, but sort of most rewarding as well. So the first one is, is known as falsification. And the falsification is simply trying to find a sequence of disturbances that lead to failure. Um, and uh, your first reaction to this might be that uh, if we're looking for any such sequence of disturbances, we may find ourselves in a situation where we're finding failures uh, that were, say, impossible to avoid. Um, so we may not care about finding any such uh, sequence of disturbances, uh, but instead we might care about finding the most likely uh, sequence of disturbances that leads to a failure. So in this case, we're still looking for a failure of our autonomous system, um, but subject uh, to a maximization of its probability. Um, so if we have a good model of the world, we want to find the ways in which our system will fail that are most likely. Then we may want to estimate the probability that our system fails. Um, so this is just trying to uh, sort of count up all the different possible failure modes and put a, a single figure on how likely it is for our system to violate the safety specification. 
And then sort of the most complete description of the failures would be to try to approximate the distribution over failures, where we come up with a sampling distribution where every disturbance trajectory that we sample from it causes a failure, um, but they're all unique to one another and sort of uh, the likelihood is comparable to the true likelihood of the disturbance trajectories. Um, but so for the purposes of this talk, I'm mostly gonna focus on the most likely failure analysis um, through a technique that we call adaptive stress testing. So adaptive stress testing is basically trying to find the most likely failure of a system, uh, and it uses reinforcement, reinforcement learning techniques to do this. Um, okay, so um, before we kind of conclude this first introductory segment, um, I'm actually gonna show you an example of adaptive stress testing, not applied to autonomous vehicles, but applied to aircraft collision avoidance. And the reason I'm doing this is I think that uh, aviation is a, is a really great example of a, a field that has done amazing things uh, in terms of safety. It's like the safest form of transportation uh, we have. And um, so I think the techniques that have, been wor have worked there could also be used in, in the field of um, autonomous driving. So uh, every commercial aircraft on, has on board a collision avoidance system um, called TCAS. And uh, TCAS can, consists of a beacon that sort of surveys the, the local area of the aircraft to see if there are any other aircraft that are potentially going, going to come and collide with it. Uh, if it detects another aircraft that's getting close, uh, the two beacons on the two aircraft will coordinate and give advisories to the pilot to tell them to either climb or descend and therefore avoid any possibility of a collision. Um, so this system was put in place um, uh, a while back and has been wildly successful. So we might ask the question, um, what sequences of disturbances in the environment of these two aircraft might actually lead to a failure of TCAS and therefore a collision or a near collision of these two aircraft? So we can first ask, um, uh, what disturbances might we apply to the aircraft? So we could control sort of the acceleration of the two aircraft and their trajectories prior to the, um, the advisories. Uh, there may be some noise in the beacon measurements of the position of the other aircraft. And then we have a pilot in the loop. So this, we might have variations on the response time of the pilot or the actions of the pilot prior, prior to receiving the advisory. Um, so because we're using reinforcement learning to solve this problem, we need to define a reward function that basically encourages our adversary to discover failure scenarios. Um, so I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail, but I'll just point out um, sort of the big pieces of what this reward function looks like. First of all, we have to penalize the algorithm for not finding a failure. Um, so it's gonna do its best to try to find a failure, which in this case is a, a near miss of the two aircraft. In order to help it find the failure, we can include a small reward signal that is the miss distance or the, the point of closest approach between the two aircraft. Um, so it's gonna try to minimize this distance uh, with the assumption being that the closer the two aircraft ultimately get, the closer we were to an actual collision. And then the last piece of this uh, would be to uh, encourage uh, likely disturbances by including the probability uh, of those disturbances. And so we're gonna try to maximize the disturbances while also trying to avoid this large penalty um, by finding, finding failures. Um, so then this was solved using uh, reinforcement learning uh, online planning technique called uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search, um, which searches for sequences of disturbances that lead to failures. Okay, so just a, a few results before we break for the first set of questions. Um, so the uh, adaptive stress testing was able to find uh, a number of failure modes of an early form of uh, this next generation aircraft collision avoidance system. Um, so for example, it found this failure mode where the two aircraft uh, sort of start on near parallel trajectories, um, but prior to the advisories, they kind of both converge both horizontally and vertically. Um, and then some advisories are given, but the pilot uh, response time was kind of slow, and this caused a series of changing advisories that ultimately led to uh, a near midair collision. Um, and so, you know, this is a scenario that we can look at and say, okay, what might we have done differently or tweaked uh, our collision avoidance system to avoid problems like this? And we can also um, look at sort of how computationally efficient uh, adaptive stress testing is compared to some baseline techniques. So we could imagine just running many, many uh, simulations um, with random disturbances each time and see whether or not we actually get any failures. So that approach is represented by uh, MC or for Monte Carlo. And we see that regardless of the amount of computation time we spent, we actually saw no failures uh, found just with this random technique. 
But if we introduce a little machine learning into the mix and sort of adaptively sample uh, points that seem promising, uh, then we're able to sort of dramatically increase the number of failures we found. And this is going to really help us design better and better systems because now we have many examples in which uh, failures can occur. So uh, with that, I'm going to pause and open the floor to some questions. Thanks, Anthony, for that uh, introduction and motivation for um, adaptive stress testing. Um, I do see one question that asks about where they can find publications and papers on this. Um, so this, you, you will find this video um, later um, that you can refer to all the publications, but Anthony, I think you have a consolidated slide. Yeah, at the end. Website you can point them to. Yeah, so there'll be a few publications, as you can see at the bottom here, and then they'll all be consolidated at the end. Um, that'll be the last slide, and you can just take a screenshot of that. Perfect. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, th there was one about um, uh, the, the penalty associated with failure. I wonder if you can uh, just spend a minute on uh, going deeper into that topic. Yeah, I absolutely. So um, one of the first things to note is that uh, when we say uh, reward in this context, I think it's a little bit misleading because uh, in this case, a high reward is going to correspond with a really bad event. Um, so we're look our adversary algorithm is looking for failure modes. Um, and so we're going to try to encourage it to find failures. Um, so basically what we do is we have some constant factor, uh, basically a large penalty if it does not find a failure. So conversely, if it does find a failure, then it does not suffer that penalty. Uh, and we just have to tune this parameter to make it large enough so that um, basically any failure is better than not finding a failure, um, despite the other rewards that it can get. Um, so this is just kind of a hyperparameter that you play around with, um, but typically we can just throw in a big number there, like 10,000, and um, that seems sufficient. One more question here on the topic is, how would you measure the completeness of the search in covering the possible failure modes? Yeah, that's a, uh, it's a fantastic question um, and, and an open one. So one of the benefits to um, using just a strict Monte Carlo uh, search algorithm is that you can kind of generate some uh, notion of probabilistic bounds. So like if you have run a thousand simulations and you haven't found any failures, then you can say that uh, your probability of failure is probably not much larger than one in a thousand. Um, but with these reinforcement learning techniques, uh, they don't quite have the same types of probabilistic guarantees um, that you can use. Uh, I have one paper that I'll, I'll talk about in this next section that does try to uh, give some probabilistic bounds on how much of the search space you've covered. Um, but really what we're looking at here are empirically good results. So we find that Monte Carlo tree search, although we don't know for sure that it has covered the space of all possible failures. At very least, it's able to, to find some failures with much higher probability than simple Monte Carlo methods. But that is a very good and open question. And finally, uh, also um, an, an idea of how large is the state space for the autonomous vehicle scenarios? Um, yeah, I will get into that in the second part, but they can be incredibly large. Um, so techniques that do have really good uh, sort of guarantees of coverage typically involve trying to search over the entire set of states that you might enter. Um, but this is uh, completely intractable for a, a realistic driving scenario. So um, I'll talk about some techniques in this next part that uh, tries to mitigate that problem. Okay, um, before we go there, let's uh, take another quick poll. Um, if the audience could, could just answer this question about how familiar you are with rules-based driving, um, specifically um, examples such as Intel's Mobileye, Responsibility Sensitive Safety, or NVIDIA Safety Force Field. Um, it would be great to understand before we proceed into, into the next topic, which is about challenges in, uh, in adaptive stress testing. Okay, closing the poll now. 
um, and sharing out the results. Looks like uh, a lot of the folks are once again heard of um, rules-based specifications, but but don't really actually use them on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, um, go ahead, Anthony, to to the next section of, of the of today's talk. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, with that sort of introduction of the technique as a whole, I'm going to talk about how we're going to apply it to the domain of autonomous vehicles, um, but also some of the challenges that come up because autonomous driving uh, is, as was pointed out, a potentially very complex environment to deal with, um, and we're going to have to adapt our algorithms to try to handle that. Um, so just you know, a quick summary, we're going to have to control disturbances in our environment. Uh, we're going to need a model of those disturbances, either through data or expert knowledge. Uh, to kind of determine which disturbances are more likely than others. And then we're going to seek to find the most likely collision scenario. So in, in this, for the rest of this talk, we're going to talk about failures as simply a collision between the ego vehicle and some other agent on the road. Um, so as one simple example that we can look at uh, is this crosswalk scenario. So here we have a vehicle that is approaching a crosswalk uh, from the left and there's a pedestrian that's trying to cross. So the vehicle is going to have some form of imperfect sensing. Um, so it's going to try to measure the position of the pedestrian, but there's going to be some error in its uh, measurement of the pedestrian's position and velocity. Um, and then we may also control the, the acceleration of the pedestrian uh, so that the pedestrian can kind of behave in any way that the adversary chooses um, to try to induce a collision between the ego vehicle and the pedestrian. Um, so if we run sort of a, a random, oops, Okay, so if we run just a, a random uh, uh, sort of rollout of this, uh, we get something that looks like uh, this video here, where we have a, a pedestrian that enters into the uh, street, and you'll see a white box around the pedestrian. That just is basically the vehicle's idea of where the pedestrian is. So the vehicle has the pedestrian location uh, pretty well localized, and therefore it kind of comes to a safe stop, a safe distance away from the vehicle. So now we're going to ask the question, uh, what types of disturbances applied to the pedestrian motion and the sensor noise might actually lead to, to a collision between these two agents. Um, and I'll just note that we use a, a really simple model for the sensor noise where we, uh, and the pedestrian acceleration where they're simply Gaussian uh, with some central mean. Um, so for the acceleration, the pedestrian starts with a velocity and then has accelerations that are, uh, have a mean zero and some standard deviation. Um, and so when we actually run adaptive stress testing on this scenario, um, we get the following failure mode. Um, so here, the uh, vehicle senses the car appropriately, um, but the pedestrian basically turns acceleration towards the car and kind of just runs headlong into it. Um, so you know, as an engineer, we look at this and say, uh, that's not a failure mode that we most care about for our vehicle. Our vehicle actually seems to be doing the smart thing here, and it's really this pedestrian um, that is the problem. And so um, we want to we want to know: okay, is, are there other failure modes that are much more relevant to the operation of the vehicle? Uh, and how do we distinguish those types of failure modes from these more ridiculous ones? Um, so in order to do that, um, the idea is to apply uh, a rules-based uh, driving specification, uh, like the ones you were asked about. In this case, I used Intel Mobilize uh, Responsibility Sensitive Safety. So for those of you who aren't too familiar with this, um, it's a rules-based system uh, that can ensure safe driving. Uh, and it's basically a set of like five common sense uh, driving rules that we're all familiar with, such as do not hit someone from behind or don't cut in recklessly, um, right of way is given, not taken, et cetera. And it takes these common sense principles and formalizes them into mathematical statements um, about what is okay to do on the road and what is not okay to do on the road. So the statements themselves um, are used first to evaluate the level of safety of a situation. Um, so this plot down here on the left uh, shows that video that you just watched uh, where the pedestrian runs into the car. Um, this big black box is the car, and you see its, its um, locations over time. So you can see that it slows down over time and, and comes to a complete stop, whereas the pedestrian turns and accelerates towards the vehicle. So each of these time steps we can um, sort of mark as either safe or dangerous. And we see that uh, sort of at the end, right before the, a collision is imminent, uh, responsibility sensitive safety can identify that those time steps are dangerous uh, and someone needs to do something to avoid a collision. Um, 
but then more importantly, uh, responsibility sensitive safety can assign a level of responsibility or blame to each party involved in the collision. So it can actually classify each action that each actor took uh, as either something that was proper and allowed according to the rules of RSS or uh, was improper in some way. And so we can actually look at the different time steps of the vehicle in that same situation and observe that all of them were indeed proper according to the rules of RSS. Uh, and this sort of puts the blame on the pedestrian. Um, so I'm not going to weigh in on whether or not I think RSS should be sort of employed widely or not, um, but I will say it is a useful technique for um, for actually sort of differentiating scenarios in which the vehicle obviously behaved improperly and which situations the vehicle seemed to behave properly. And it can kind of, we can use it as a filter to find those failure modes that are most interesting to us. Okay, so how do we actually incorporate RSS into adaptive stress testing? Um, we can start by on each simulation, uh, classifying each time step as either safe or dangerous, and then whether the actions of the ego vehicle were proper or improper. And then we can redefine our failures to include only the scenarios in which the autonomous vehicle behaved improperly prior to a collision. So we say a certain trajectory uh, is a failure, which is the set uh, E. If it, uh, sorry, it's a failure according to RSS, if it was a failure according to our collision metric, and if the number of improper time steps exceeded some critical threshold. So you could say if it, if it ever exceeded, or sorry, if it ever uh, did an improper action, then it's a failure, or you can uh, say that maybe we're only looking for more egregious um, violations of RSS. So that's something that you can tune. And then we can provide a high reward to the adversary um, if it's able to induce a larger amount of improper uh, behavior for the autonomous vehicle. So with this small tweak to our reward function, uh, we begin to find uh, failures that look like this. So in this video, we can see that the pedestrian kind of, rather than walking straight across the street, um, being obvious about it, kind of uh, angles uh, a little bit diagonally. Um, and the sensor noise is sort of biased to the right of the vehicle. So the vehicle thinks that the pedestrian is still on uh, the sidewalk and therefore does, fails to slow down. Uh, it strikes the pedestrian. So this is a much more realistic scenario um, that we'd have to then go back and evaluate, you know, are our sensors going to experience this much noise? Are pedestrians likely to do something like this? Because um, it's clearly a weakness of the driving policy. Um, so you can take a look at a paper that we wrote about this um, at ITSC uh, this past year and the citation is there. Okay, so another challenge um, gets to this question of scalability. So um, the, the scenario that I just showed you with a vehicle and a pedestrian uh, just has two agents interacting on the road and um, we can, uh, there's a few enough possible configurations that we can almost sort of exhaustively search the possible set of uh, interactions between those two agents. But as soon as you introduce a third or a fourth or a fifth agent into the scene, um, the number of possible combination of uh, interactions can blow up exponentially. Um, so in this example here, we have say an ego vehicle in blue trying to take a, a unprotected left turn. And we have four other adversaries that are on the road. And so if we were to do a really, really coarse discretization of all the possible configurations of these vehicles, we already have 10 to the 13 states. Um, and this is just completely intractable if we're trying to actually enumerate all the possible configurations. Um, so in order to deal with problems like this, um, the idea that we had was to try to leverage this, the structure of driving um, by decomposing the scene into a series of pairwise interactions between each adversary and the ego vehicle. Uh, then for each of those uh, pairwise interactions, we can solve the safety validation problem. So we can kind of discover the most likely failure modes between each pair of vehicles. And then we try to recombine all the solutions together and refine our, our, uh, our safety validation using rollouts of the full simulator. Um, so, you know, we're acknowledging that there might be some structure to be leveraged here uh, based on pairwise interactions, but also there are complexities that can arise from the joint interaction of various vehicles. So we have to make sure to try to take that into account or else we won't be able to actually use what we learned in these subproblems. So in order to combine our solutions together, um, we can use a transfer learning approach that's uh, called the Tend, Adapt, and Transfer, or A2T. Um, so if we have K subproblems, then we can combine those subproblems into a, a single solution uh, using the following uh, network architecture. Um, so I'm going to talk about this at kind of a high level, but basically 
you have the state of your system um, and it's passed in first to those K solutions, which are these green boxes right here. And they each give their best predictions about what disturbances should be applied in order to cause collision. At the same time, we have a base network, which is trying to um, figure out which actions are most likely to cause a failure uh, from scratch. So it's assuming we know nothing about the uh, previously learned solutions and it's just gonna try to solve this whole problem from scratch. And then we have an attention network, uh, which is assigning weights to each of these predictions, depending on how good they end up being. Um, so the goal of the attention network is to figure out when you should pay attention to which solutions or the base network uh, in order to find uh, the most likely failures of the complete system. Then we use this uh, architecture to try to induce failures of our full simulator. And the failures that we find or don't find, uh, we use that to backpropagate through our network uh, to update those weights in the, ba ne in the base network uh, in order to ultimately generate as many failures as we can or of failures of the highest likelihood. Okay, um, so just to give you an idea of what that looks like. So the, the scenario I just show you, showed you is gonna play out here on the left. Um, but on the right, we're going to see uh, the attention weights. And these are basically what the network is paying attention to. Um, so it's either one of the four cars or the base network itself. So at the beginning of the simulation, it is relying upon its own estimate, the base network, but quickly realizes that the pink car uh, is the most likely failure mode here because the blue car is kind of waiting for all these other cars to pass. And then the pink car uh, decides at the last second to not make a turn, uh, which leads the blue car to try to execute its turn and causes a collision. Um, so with this technique, we're able to take this rather complicated problem and start to sort of leverage some structure, underlying structure, and use it to, to find failure modes of our, of our system. Um, so we can compare this technique to other uh, baseline techniques like the Monte Carlo technique that I've talked about, as well as some more advanced techniques like the cross-entry method. And we find that our technique can find uh, about two orders of magnitude more failures um, than these other techniques. Uh, and all those failures have relatively high log, uh, likelihood, uh, meaning that we're not just finding the completely like ridiculous failure modes um, that are extremely unlikely. And because of this, we can actually use our approach to try to estimate the probability of failure. Um, so when I said I was gonna be talking about uh, techniques that can be a little bit more rigorous uh, on putting a, a bound on how likely our system is to fail, uh, you can take a look at this paper here uh, which talks about uh, basically trying to estimate the probability of failure. Um, so this plot on the right here shows our estimate of the probability of failure versus the number of samples we had to use. And our technique in purple is able to find a good estimate of the probability of failure after just about 10 samples, where the, whereas the other techniques either fail to get a good estimate or require hundreds or thousands of samples uh, to do so. So I think um, doing something like this scene decomposition approach at a high level is going to be really important for um, finding those failure events that are uh, either really rare or complex with a lot of agents on the road. Okay, so with that, um, that covers some of the challenges of adaptive stress testing, and I will pause there and open it up for some questions. Please go ahead and type in your questions into the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to read out, uh, I'm going to combine two of the questions here into, into one, Anthony asking about the correlation or the, or the differences between uh, simulated and real life mm -hmm. and, uh, and how, how do you handle, how do you handle that? Um, yeah, that, that is a, a, a great question um, that I don't necessarily have a great answer for, but um, the idea would be to identify um, possible weaknesses of the autonomous vehicle in simulation and kind of use that as a filter uh, to guide the, the real life testing of the vehicle. So you could think of this on, on a scale of fidelity. So you might have at the bottom a, a low fidelity model, like the ones you're seeing here, which are kind of 2D and maybe don't involve uh, vision-based perception systems. And you could find a bunch of possible failure modes of your autonomous vehicle policy there. And then you can take what you've learned about um, what causes your system to fail and move it up to a higher fidelity simulation architecture like Carla or something that actually has vision and 3D modeling and whatnot and see which ones um, cause failures in that environment. And then when you have found failures in your higher fidelity environment, maybe that's when you actually go set up a scenario uh, in the real world and test a real vehicle. So I see this as kind of a way of filtering out possible failure modes that you can then um, kind of test in the real world. 
Oh, thank you. The, um, there was a comment about the failure rates that you showed uh, at 10 to the negative 10 being incredibly low. And how is that calibrated or, or is it calibrated or, or with regard to um, the real life? Oh, right. Um, yeah, so those are a function, uh, the failure rate in that scenario was a function of uh, both the quality of the driving policy as well as the, li the likelihood of the different disturbances that were applied. And these are things that kind of um, I as the research engineer have control over. So I can say that, you know, I can just declare that we have a sensor that has a very small range of, um, of noise and therefore, you know, uh, uh, erroneous measurement is incredibly unlikely. So I can kind of tune how likely these failure modes are. Um, what I'd like to do is try to t make these simulations have a similar failure rate to um, something we'd see out in the real world. Um, so ultimately, you know, we try to be looking for failures on the order of 10 to the minus eight or 10 to the minus nine per hour. Um, but in real life, in, in the very simple driving policies that I'm using, the failure rates are, are gonna be um, higher than that. Okay. Uh, another question is how the FAA, do you know how the FAA actually certified the, the system that you mentioned? Uh, oh, the ACAS-X? Um, yeah, I, I'm not from, uh, super familiar with the details. I know they did an extensive amount of um, sort of testing against the, so there was a, the existing system, which was a rules-based system, and the new system uh, is an optimal control-based system. Um, and I know they did a lot of comparison between the two. Um, but yeah, the details of that, I think you can find online in a series of papers. Cool. Um, also uh, uh, along those lines, is there a notion of dissimilarity of accident scenario? So uh, that, yeah. yeah, that uh, is a, a great question because one of the, the drawbacks to some of these reinforcement learning techniques is that they'll see uh, a sample failure um, and then kind of um, use it over and over again to induce very similar failures. Um, so in that very first paper I talked about um, where we used uh, RSS to try to find failures that were kind of most salient, um, in that paper we talk about ways to, of uh, as soon as you find a failure, kind of rejecting failures that are too similar to it. So you make sure you get a diversity of failures. But that's another thing you could sort of include in the reward function to make sure you're seeing a, a diversity of failures. And uh, one question I'll also read here is, can responsibility be attributed to a specific sensor in the car? Oh, that's a great question. Um, perhaps, uh, I haven't thought too much about it. Like in the, in the responsibility sensitive uh, safety paper, they assign responsibility based solely on sort of the actions or like the accelerations of the vehicle. Um, so you'd have to probably do an additional step where you back trace sort of the responsibility of that you know, action to uh, which sensor, but I don't think I'm qualified to say whether or not that's possible. Okay, let's um, move on in the interest of time to the next topic. But uh, as before, let me ask a couple of really quick um, questions. Uh, the first here would be uh, your familiarity with formal verification. If you could take a look at your poll or answer it, I would appreciate that. Closing the poll in just a few more seconds. Okay, so um, looks like for most of the audience today um, are familiar with it, uh, but haven't actually worked uh, worked on it uh, personally in terms of formal verification methods. And uh, one last poll that we'd like to get before we proceed to the last section um, here is, is your familiarity with uh, vision-based perception. A simple yes or no question, if you could let us know where, uh, how familiar you are with vision-based perception. Okay, and uh, clearly I think the answer here is uh, about two thirds of the folks 
actually working on vision-based perception of some sort. Okay. Thank you very much, and let's uh, jump right in. Okay, sounds good. Um, well, so this next part, um, for those of you who work with uh, camera-based perception systems, I think we'll find it really interesting. Um, this work was performed by a colleague in my lab, Kyle Julian, uh, who's recently graduated. Um, and so I'll be able to answer some questions about this, but if you're curious to get in touch with him, you can uh, email him there. Um, so the idea behind this project was to see if we could perform safety validation on a neural network uh, controller that was trained cause an aircraft to follow the center line of a runway. Um, so of course this, this type of autonomous driving uh, is not the same as driving on a complex roadway, uh, but I think it's gonna illustrate some really interesting ideas uh, that are sort of the, the future of safety validation with neural networks. So the question we wanna ask is, can image errors make the aircraft leave the, the runway? Um, so just to give you an idea, we have an aircraft that's taxiing and it has some camera that's on its wing and it's looking down the runway and it's just trying to drive in a straight line. Um, okay, so first uh, I'm gonna describe what this neural network controller looks like. Um, and the structure of this uh, network is, is special because we wanna do some um, specific things using formal verification with it. So um, I'll talk about that in a moment. But basically we get a camera, uh, we have a camera, that's taking an image along the runway. We then downsample that image, uh, turn it into grayscale to kind of make the image as compressed as possible while still retaining uh, some of the primary features um, such as sort of the center line or the line on the right here. And then we pass that into a neural network. And this neural network, we're gonna try to keep as small as possible so that we can actually use some of these formal verification techniques um, to do some interesting things. And um, this neural network is going to try to predict the error, the cross-check error, which is just how off the center line it is, as well as the heading error, which is how off uh, the angle of the aircraft is. Um, the cross-check error and the heading error are then passed into a proportional control law, uh, which outputs a, a rudder and a nose wheel command. And then we use the dynamics of the aircraft to kind of iterate the system forward in time. And the goal of this neural network controller uh, is to make the aircraft go straight. Uh, and this is all done using the X-Plane simulator. Um, so this small neural network actually works pretty well for uh, getting the aircraft to go straight from a variety of different initial conditions. Um, so this is, these paths show uh, the convergence of the aircraft into the center line. And this can be done in a variety of different um, weather conditions, clear and overcast. Okay, so uh, now we want to ask the question, what uh, perturbations to our image um, might cause our aircraft to go off the runway? Um, so this is where we can actually leverage uh, formal verification, which is a technique for understanding the, the bounds of error that our neural network can induce due to noise. So if we first define a, sort of a range of, of possible uh, disturbances applied to the image, um, and then we have some output due to the neural network as well as the rudder controller, we can use these formal verification techniques to, to, uh, to maximize either the left uh, the leftmost rudder command or the rightmost rudder command. Um, so the tool that they use is called uh, Marabu. And so anyone who's interested in the verification of neural networks should take a look at this tool. Um, it's uh, been developed uh, in part by our lab and uh, has been used for a variety of really interesting um, safety validation tasks. But the idea uh, that you should know is it, it's basically able to find um, the input set of noise that can maximally change the rudder position of the aircraft. Um, so uh, one thing you might uh, consider doing is say, okay, choose a direction and then try to uh, maximally make the rudder go in that direction so that uh, the aircraft kind of turns, veers off, off uh, runway as much as possible. Um, so that's what was tried here. We're just going to apply the leftmost disturbance using Marabu uh, at every time step and try to get our vehicle, we're just going to try to push it off the roadway. Um, and we limit the amount of noise that we can apply. Um, I think in this case, it's around 3% or so of the uh, scale of the image. Um, and we find that we can't actually get the aircraft to go off the runway. At a certain point, uh, the amount of error that we're allowed to introduce actually doesn't, uh, isn't enough to trick the controller into uh, being wrong enough to be um, off, the, off the runway. Um, so you might think, okay, great, this neural network controller is uh, seemingly safe. If we apply the maximal disturbance at every time step, uh, then we're not going to leave the runway. Um, but unfortunately, that's, that's not quite true. Uh, and we can actually um, combine this technique with adaptive stress testing. Um, so 
adapt now with adaptive stress testing, the disturbances we're going to apply are going to be either the leftmost or the rightmost error um, that we can get using uh, Marabou. So we can do this with a, a variety of different noise levels on the image. So we can first assume that the, the noise will never be greater than 2% of the, the image range. Um, and then see if we can apply uh, left or right disturbances in a sequence to get the aircraft to, to leave the runway. So in this case, we try a bunch of different possibilities and the best one that we find only has sort of a small deviation of the cross track error. So under these conditions, it looks pretty likely that our, um, our controller is robust to disturbances and noise of up to 2%. But as soon as we get up to a level of about 3%, um, we can begin finding these failure modes where uh, the aircraft is initially pushed off to the left. Um, after it gets to a certain point, then it quickly switches the air over to the rightmost um, angle and it sort of using its momentum eventually veers off the side. Um, we can find even easier um, failure modes if the noise level, level is increased up to a point of about 4% where we can simply just push the aircraft off the side um, by always applying the leftmost disturbance. Um, so this gives us a, a really um, sort of efficient way of finding failure modes in a vision-based uh, perception system. Um, so just to show you what that looks like in practice, um, we start, you can actually look at the numbers of the, the rudder error up here. Initially, the rudder error is, is negative, so the aircraft is veering off to the right, um, but then you'll see it quickly switches over to a positive um, rudder error and uh, the aircraft kind of swings around and eventually, um, as we'll see, goes off uh, the edge of the runway. And this is for a noise level of up to 3.5%. Uh, okay. Um, so with that, um, we can also look at uh, variations of the adaptive stress testing formulation. So in the original case, we talked about just choosing either the leftmost disturbance or the rightmost disturbance. Uh, and with this, we can, um, you know, we have to have a relatively high value of, of noise in order to get the aircraft to go off the runway. Um, but if we include uh, more possible actions, so now we're gonna include errors that you can either make a, a maximal disturbance with 3.5% error or a disturbance with 1.75% error. Uh, and then you can trade off between these different actions. Um, and this is all done using Monte Carlo's research. Now we can find sequences of disturbances that lead to failure, but the actual average um, perturbation to the image is only about 3.1%. So this is reducing um, sort of the needed noise in the image uh, to cause a failure. And then lastly, we can refine this even further and, and say, uh, split it up into three levels of disturbances, uh, left and right. And now we can find uh, longer sequences of uh, disturbances uh, where the average amount of noise was now only 2.8%. Um, and so you can play this game and sort of find uh, what maybe the threshold of noise is allowed in your downsampled images um, that could ensure the safety of your aircraft um, according to adaptive stress testing. So this doesn't provide um, an official formal guarantee of safety, but does do a very good job of identifying the weak spots in the controller um, and we can be used to, to kind of identify the thresholds of, uh, of noise uh, that would be allowed in, in such a system. Okay, so I'm just gonna conclude um, by talking about a few directions that I think are really exciting and are of, of large amount of importance for autonomous vehicles going forward. Um, so the first is going to be the formal verification of larger networks. So in formal verification, it, just to remind you, we're, we're trying to um, certify certain properties of our networks or a closed loop control system um, to prove that it does what we want it to do. And right now we have the capability of verifying relatively small and simple neural networks, um, such as the one you saw in the taxi net. Um, but this doesn't scale to the, the large deep neural networks that are likely gonna be used uh, for autonomous vehicles. Um, so if we can uh, scale up these algorithms to be applied to much longer, larger networks, or maybe even do it in a somewhat approximate uh, but robust sense, um, then that could be really exciting. Uh, another area that I think it could benefit um, safety validation is the improvement of reinforcement learning algorithms for finding failures. Um, so this, uh, I think, can come in the form of better sample efficiency, uh, as well as uh, techniques that are able to find uh, sort of more rare failures um, that don't rely just on sampling-based methods. And then the last uh, piece, which is something I'm currently working on, is 
uh, speeding up the safety validation process across different scenarios or across different driving policies. So you can imagine um, if you're working on an autonomous vehicle and uh, you're making updates to the policy every week or every two weeks, uh, you want to perform some sort of like regression type testing to this. And uh, in addition to sort of retaining a suite of tests that you want to perform on your vehicle, you may also want to perform the sort of adversarial uh, adaptive stress testing. Um, so perhaps we could use what we learned from previous cycles of this uh, stress testing to inform um, the safety validation of current, uh, perhaps better policies. And this can save a huge amount on computational complexity while not uh, limiting sort of the, the um, ability of the safety validation algorithms. So with that, I'll leave it, leave it on the list of publications that I think covers everything I talked about in here. So feel free to screenshot this um, and I'll open it up to one final round of questions. Excellent. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, there are a few questions here. Uh, let me start with uh, formal verification. Does, 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 does formal verification techniques work in the presence of adversarial data? Uh, yeah, so that, that is what is, um, in my opinion, really incredible about formal verification is you can prove properties about a, a neural network um, subject to all possible inputs. So you can basically prove that as long as the inputs don't change by a certain amount, you're always guaranteed that some property holds. Um, so that means that no adversary, no matter how complex, is going to able to be able to find a sequence of inputs that uh, does something other than what you want it to do. Um, so I think that's really, really an amazing feature of formal verification, but that's also what makes it so computationally expensive. Um, there's a question from, I think, the earlier section when you presented the simulation. Um, does the simulation searching for a counterexample need to run in uh, real time, or can it get to be faster than real time? Yeah. Um, so ideally, you would run it faster in real time, because many of these algorithms uh, are going to be limited by the simulation time and not by the machine learning side of things. Um, so if you can create a simulator that can run faster in real time, uh, all the better. Um, I know from experience that many of the higher fidelity simulators are often kind of restricted to running uh, in real time uh, if they're taking in uh, visual data and whatnot. And in fact, the taxi net example that I just showed, all of that validation was done in real time. Um, so these things are possible to do, but you know, the faster you can do it, uh, the more kind of cases you can run. And uh, can AST be used to define specifications, say, for example, sensors or controllers? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. And I think it's kind of alluded to with this taxi net example where um, you might be able to have some sort of parameter like the amount of noise that you can uh, adjust and run multiple runs of adaptive stress testing and find the threshold at which you can or cannot find failures and perhaps use that as a threshold for saying uh, our sensor has to be at least this good. Right, cool. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, please ask now. Um, we will uh, make sure to close it on time because we have, uh, we're actually almost right on time. So um, let's, uh, we'll just take a moment uh, to thank Anthony for, uh, for all the, um, for sharing all this information with us. I think that's really good. Um, and if there are further questions that uh, people think of, um, can they, uh, you know, contact you? And if so, you know, can you just share your, your contact information? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me on uh, LinkedIn and I'm sure you can associate my contact information with this uh, talk. Excellent. Well, thank you very much again, Anthony. Really appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed uh, this talk. And um, um, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, please uh, stay uh, for the audience. Please do uh, uh, make sure to, to visit uh, the Apex AI website where we will host uh, um, um, a recording of this talk and you'll also find uh, more such talks coming up in the future. Thanks, that's it for now.